At the university where I teach, it's common, extremely common, to see this. Massive Hercules turboprops flying over the campus as they practice parachute drops. They come in low. You can hear the smooth grind of their turbines. These planes are expensive, well-built machines. Their fuel is expensive, too. And there are other exercises in this area as well. In the evening, wings of helicopters buzz in over the local farms and factories. This happens day after day, week after week. It's an expensive operation, the military. But that expense doesn't deter South Korea, a relatively small economy. And that's because of the residual trauma of the Korean War, in which the North almost won. South Korea, as much as any nation can be considered a holistic, sing single-minded entity, made a simple decision, never again. That's what the parachute drops are about, a martial exercise, but also an anxiety-sourced ritual. A desire to be strong in the present to compensate for weakness, humiliation in the past. For millennia, a peninsula of land in Northeast Asia has been home to the group of people now known as Koreans. From a time centuries before Christ, dynasties were formed, battled each other or Chinese or Japanese armies, and fell. The final dynasty was one of the longest, the Joseon. It has been characterized by Bruce Cummings as not so much a feudal state as an agrarian bureaucracy whose, quote, chief characteristic was a strong and enduring tension between central bureaucratic power and landed wealth, unquote. In this form of social organization, which would look like feudalism to a Westerner, two groupings of officials, the civil and the military, or the Yangban class, held sway. They ruled over a massive peasantry, as well as outcast groups such as tanners, entertainers, and slaves. The experience of the subordinate social classes was one of subordinate power. Yangban officials, when corrupt or cruel, could get away with thievery or worse. The Joseon dynasty ended with Japanese imperial ascendancy. After a power struggle between the regional superpowers of Russia, China, and Japan, and to extent the United States, Korea was colonized by Japan in the early 20th century. This national disaster led to several decades of often brutal colonial rule. However, while Koreans, especially Koreans who dared voice their nationalism, were suppressed, those who collaborated with Japanese power were rewarded. And the Japanese who settled in Korea in order to, quote-unquote, advance the country, took advantage of their superior status to acquire material wealth. By the end of the Japanese colonial period, Japanese authorities were attempting to snuff out a separate Korean identity and assimilate Koreans into their own cultural orbit while keeping Korean individuals in a subordinate social position. During World War II, Japanese exploitation of Korea became rawer still and led to the enslavement of thousands of Korean workers as well as the kidnapping and rape of thousands more Korean women. The result for Korean society was a psychic scar which is still traumatic and was never fully resolved on a political level. Japanese rule was only broken by the defeat of the Empire of Japan by the U.S. in 1945. After this, a period of occupation by the Americans and Russians, now the Soviets, followed. This period ended in 1948 and 1949 with the creation of two new nation-states, the Republic of Korea, ROK, and the People's Democratic Republic of Korea, DPRK. These two nations now existed out of what a few years before had been one country with the same linguistic and ethnic root. Again, this trauma of separation has, as everyone knows, not yet found a political solution. Oftentimes it seems as if South Korea has, in its day-to-day -day life, quote, forgotten, unquote, the North. 
Yet, a yearning for reunification runs strong and sometimes finds its expression culturally. Certainly, the causes of the national separation find their expression culturally. And the war itself exists as an alpha point of the modern Korean sensibility. The newly minted nations of North and South Korea were vehement ideological enemies, and though the awkward and highly artificial that was drawn between them, the straight line of the 38th parallel, was a somewhat porous border allowing a certain degree of commerce and interchange, the two countries' relationship was acutely antagonistic. Several border clashes took place in 1949, some of them major battles involving thousands of troops on lasting days. It was clear the peninsula was on the verge of war, and because the creation of North and South Korea was to a major degree the result of the post-World War II zones created by the U.S. and Soviet Union, this would not be a war between two differing nations in the true sense of the word. It would not even be a war between kingdoms. Instead, it would be a civil war with all the internecine rage this phrase implies. Because North and South Korea were not simply different geographic states, but also ideological states, the tensions that existed between them were reflected very vividly within their own societies. The Korean War, when it happened, would not simply be a war between armies, but also between social classes and even psychological sensibilities. Throughout early 1950, the North Korean army equipped itself for a major confrontation. Supplies were purchased from the Soviets, frequently by barter, as the North Koreans expanded their infantry and built up a tank corps and air force. The South Koreans also received military assistance from the U.S. via its Korean Military Assistance Program, KMAG. However, Throughout late winter and early spring 1950, supplies requested by KMAG were slow in coming. And despite intelligence gathered by both the South Koreans and U.S. identifying a North Korean Air Force, as well as possible intelligence suggesting a tank corps, no countervailing force was established in South Korea. The result was an indigenous army assisted by a handful of American advisors which was ill-equipped to contain an attack by an army possessing armored columns, fighter aircraft, and a small number of bombers. When war finally broke out on June 25, 1950, the defeat of the South Korean positions at the 38th parallel was swift and decisive. Though some South Korean units held out, others crumbled. The North Koreans were on the outskirts of Seoul in approximately a week's time. By this point, the Truman administration, which through the agency of Secretary of State Dean Acheson, had in January 1950 declared South Korea outside its quote, defense perimeter, unquote, declared a new policy, defense of the ROK. 